Hello, Miss Courtney Dillon. CourtneyDillon.com. How are you doing? And how's Eric? How are you doing? I love you. Eric says he's doing well. He's excited to be here. This is going to, I think this is going to be a really interesting interview. And uh, yes, so I'm excited for it. Me too. Somebody told me that we need to uh, interview Golden My Ears. So shall we start? Yes. First of all, she's is here. Yeah, she's right here. Oh, um, she, what do you see? So she's wearing actually like a very uh, plain, uh, dark suit. Um, it's actually pants, which I don't think she wore pants much when she was alive. And, but she has a, a hat on, a red hat. Today. Okay. Yeah. Red and black. Good contrast. All right. So it starts off she, with this. She says, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. for. I'm being very uh, grateful to speak with you today. Oh, thank you. And we're likewise grateful. All right. So Golda Meir was an American citizen who immigrated to Palestine in 1921 to help build a Jewish state. She was eventually elected prime minister of Israel, becoming one of the first female world leaders. All right. So here are some questions for you, uh, Prime Minister Meir. Golda, billions, billions of people of different faiths, faiths consider the land of Israel to be sacred. From your perspective as a spirit, is there anything truly unusual or special about the Holy Land? Yes. Good question. Well, yes. Tell me more about that. Um, during my various lives on the planet, I have been attracted to this particular land. This land holds collective memory mm. of awakening. This land is home to many positive portals of awareness. Wow. So portals, good portals? Yes. How about vortices? Is that the same? Yes. It, cool. it contains, uh, she shows me a picture of the land and uh, various portal centers within the land, making it particularly strong and inviting. Uh, it also holds uh, memory for the collective unconscious, which will assist people in their awakening process. Oh, I did not expect that answer. That's cool. All right. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem has been considered a sacred place for millennia. What is the origin of that belief? We'll start with that. And there's follow up questions. And she goes back really, really far. Mm. Um, ancient to ancient times. So she's talking about this is she's she's a really fascinating soul. There's so much knowledge. Um, there's so much uh, knowledge of, of history yeah. and just uh, connections. She's interesting. If you have a question about other past lives, she has very interesting things to say about that. Okay. Um, she's talking about uh, shared stories. So one of the things she wants to mention is for humans to begin to, to notice the shared stories, um, the stories that are linked throughout myths, throughout history, and throughout time. One of the uh, important uh, tasks of humanity at this time is to observe what is shared and to uncover um, and she'll talk about the particular question in a second, but to uncover the lessons in these shared stories for humans. This particular question dates back to ancient Aramaic tradition. Okay. Okay. The thousands or hundreds of thousands or thousands of years ago? Um, Tens of thousands of years ago. Okay, cool. All right, go ahead, sorry. It is important that we uncover and observe the past as one of rich history, but also as myth to further the greater understanding that humanity is searching for. I am here to assist you in uncovering today. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, well, so where did that sacred place, the Temple Mount, what was the origin of that belief of, of the Temple Mount being sacred? 
she is taught. Um, hmm. This is I did not expect this. Um, she's talking about, and this is knowledge that she did not necessarily have or understand on a conscious level when she was in most recently embodied. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, she's talking about some of these sacred places as having connection points to other um, uh, galaxies in particular, and some of our sacred points, including uh, pyramids, she's showing me a pyramid, mm -hmm. have connection points to other galaxies. It's seeded or seeded information within these sacred sites that is connected to our larger origin points. Not, wow. not expected this to- for No. Me to <laughs> All right. And is there anything special about that location? Why there? Is it because of vortices and portals or? Yes. Okay. And she's showing me in particular um, lines, ley like lines. Ley lines. Oh, yes. wow. All right. What existed on that site before Solomon's temple? Uh, seating. Uh, it's the seating of galactic and intergalactic information. So there's something underneath, or um, she shows me like layered on top of on a multi-dimensional level that is seated to other galactic um, areas. Are you saying so in the land something's buried? Some, some... Uh, not in a literal way, but yeah. we can. Uh, what we can do as humans when we when we go to a place that is collectively understood as sacred, we can sit in the location and ask to be connected with the seed or origin point of information and allow the encodement to ensue. So there's some type of way in which we can connect on a, a higher or deeper level anytime we go to a sacred site. Wow. All right. So in Jerusalem, are there any, you say about the galactic origins, uh, can you name any constellations that could be evolved or alien species that could be evolved in this? Um, the land of Jerusalem in particular, particular also is the home of what we call Christ consciousness, the mm. birthing place of Christ consciousness, and is meant to illuminate the path within in particular uh, other origin species um, galactic origins including pleiadian mm. arcturian lyrian feline and vesuvian interesting well i thought that um that the uh, jewish people did not believe in the story of Christ. So I don't understand the whole thing about Christ consciousness. I don't know very much about religion, organized religious anyway, sorry. Uh, she is not speaking of the story of Christ as the savior of humanity. She's oh, okay. I'm not speaking, but rather the consciousness that is being birthed on this plan on the planet at this time. Oh, okay. That makes sense. The Bible says that God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. Is there truth to this? Is there some spiritual connection between the Jewish people and that territory? Well, we'll start with the first one about God source. Did, gave the land. Yes, to to the, the land people. holds particular importance for the people, the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. They are connected on a soul and cellular level to the history, to the memory, and to the sacredness of this land. Okay. All right, so uh, that this is both, but did God give the land to Israel or is it just that? Uh, I do not prescribe to the idea that land is given to any people. Okay. To, they, they have a connect, spiritual connection to the land. Correct. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. What happened to the 10 lost tribes of Israel? Do they still exist today? Or are there? So please um, absorbed into other populations. She's um, smiling right now at the sort of esoteric nature of these questions. Yeah. Um, because it, she finds it uh, funny to her 
that she is now sort of a spiritual teacher in a sense, because that's not exactly how she was known on the yes, planet. She's a political leader, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So she's just smiling at this. Uh, so this is, so the 10 tribes are absorbed and integrated within various cultures at this time. So they're not lost. Okay. But absorbed. So within the bloodlines of various cultures on the planet. Okay. Well, if they do still exist, it sounds like they do. Can you give us, us uh, some examples of where they can be found? Morocco. She's showing me uh, Morocco or Northern Africa. Okay. Um, Greece. Okay. Israel. Russia. Um, to name a few. Okay. What happened to the contents of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, particularly to the giant golden menorah that is depicted on the Ark of Titus in Rome. I mean, does that menorah still exist? Uh, she's showing me an image. I don't know where, but it looks buried somewhere. Buried under, it's like buried, it's under sand and it looks like a desert. Um, it will be rediscovered in the coming decades. Oh, awesome. What about the other contents of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem? What happened to those? Looted, you know. So, she, so the original uh, contents were looted and uh, there's something happened where there's a ransack. I hear the word ransack and, yeah. and everything was stolen. Um, the contents feel looted. They're taken. I see them on the back of a man and several other people. Um, he hoards them in a like a knapsack type thing. Eventually, they are um, recovered somewhat by, and buried to keep safe. Okay. Um, some of these contents will be re rediscovered, but it doesn't look, she's showing me approximately 2032. Oh my gosh. Where do you think they are in the world? I mean, more uh, of it that. Looks, it took, when I'm asking, because I was wondering. Um, or, you know, Africa. Um, Northern Africa area. Okay. Uh, all right. What was the Ark of the Covenant? Covenant. Can you tell us the location? This is weird because I, I would like to know more about your life as prime minister, but maybe those are coming. But go ahead. Yeah, because that's what she really wants to talk about, actually. Um, oh, it's coming. I see. Okay. 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 Uh, sorry. She's. Can you repeat the question? Uh, what was the Ark of the Covenant? Where is it now? She cannot speak to that. Okay. There is a large ancient megalithic site in the Golan Heights called uh, Gilgal Raphaim. Can you tell us who built this and why? Megalithic site in the Golan Heights, Gilgal Raphaim. Again, she says she's not uh, well versed okay. on this topic. All right. Uh, well, Eric, do you know? Maybe you know. Maybe you can talk to us about that. Monolithic site. Uh, yeah, he say, he's saying there is a connection. It's interesting she brought up the, the, the star people and like the information. Um, the monolithic site. So he's talking about, Eric's talking about like um, indigenous tribes right now and their connection to star beings mm. and how that memory has, much of it has remained intact, although somewhat quiet. Um, it's beginning to resurface now, meaning that other people are becoming aware that some of these indigenous tribes have retained memory throughout all of time of their star beings that they were originally in contact with. And it looks like this monolithic site is connected in some way to an indigenous tribe and their um, reverence or their um, understanding of the, the star beings and, and oh, and the connection to other planets. Megaliths were probably yes. created, carved, whatever, by the star beings. In, in, um, in conjunction, meaning that they okay. assisted, yes. 
All right, so Eric, maybe you can answer the other question about the Ark of the Covenant. What the heck is that? Where is it now? It is a, uh, he's showing me, he says sacred text. Mm. Sacred text that, where is it? He says he doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know where it is. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right, uh, the presence of, of anti Semitism has existed for millennia and shows no signs of disappearing. From your perspective as a spirit, what, why are people so anti Semitic? I don't understand that either. Um, anti Semitism has existed throughout time because people, and she smiles as if she says this, want to point the finger at a group, a race, or a particular set of human circumstances, rather than look at um, uh, the underlying problems that humanity faces as a whole. Um, she, she wanted to entitle this talk, We Hold the Power mm. Today. Oh. And it is an important concept that she wanted to bring forth and share with humanity today. Because part of her role on the planet and in the afterlife is to remind people, um, to, she shows me the image of rolling up our sleeves, mm. rolling up our sleeves, taking action, and remembering that we hold the power. Any group or race that we judge, we are asking now, she is asking us now to look deeper at that which we hold as judgment within ourselves. Mm. So in other words, it seems like, at least for a lot of people, any Semites, uh, they've chosen the Jewish people to be their scapegoat for the problems in the world and even their own problems? Uh, yes. She shows me it's it's sort of like target practice. And hmm. like if a particular group has a designation or an assignment as the problem, yeah, uh, it becomes a part of a collective agreement to assign this group over and over as the problem. Mm. Of course, because I don't know. of the okay. misinterpretation of Christ's uh, actions, Mm. And the subsequent misinterpretation of the Jewish people, this group of people, the Jewish people, have been assigned collectively as the problem. Oh. Uh, she's talking though; it's not the only group. No, I, I was been. thinking the same thing. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the the white men are a target. Uh, blacks could be a target. Muslims are a target. I mean, it's just you know, everybody. It's like you know. So again, in the way that she was talking about myths, she encourages us as humans now to uncover the rationale or reason we choose to continually assign any group as a problem. What judgment do we hold within ourselves that we are judging in another group? What are we failing to see within ourselves yeah. What is being mirrored within ourselves? Okay, so uh, I think that a lot of um, maybe people think, well, the Jews killed Christ. Well, first of all, that's not true because he did not die on the cross. Um, and historians are discovering evidence that he did survive and live a, a complete, full, full, full life in France. There's artifacts and, and such. But uh, so is that the main drive for anti Semitism? Like, you killed Jesus. Is that it? Yes, and yes, that's the main driver, but she also speaks to uh, a particular misunderstanding of cultural practices and traditions that has uh, permeated different portions of the planet at various times. For example? Um, She's talking about the traditions of the holy holidays, 
mm -hmm. Yom Kippur, uh, Seder, Passover. Um, she's talking about the way in which we as a people uh, worship has been criticized greatly throughout time. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of blame to go around. I mean, I, I don't understand. Maybe the Jewish people are not completely innocent, but it seems like, I don't know very much about the, the, the history of Jew, the Jewish people, but I know the history of Christianity with the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition and so much death. And, and of course, she, she responds, she agrees. Too. I she, mean, so she so wants to say that no, death. no oh. people, none of us are innocent. But what, what yeah. have the Jews done? They have, have they killed as many people as Chris, the Christian religion has? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know much about the history there, but, or that the, the, the um, Islamic uh, jihadis, uh, I don't know. She would encourage you, Elisa, she's saying, to uh, view this, view this with an expanded perspective. Instead of viewing it as who has killed the most people, yeah, probably uh, Jews have suffered the most or something like that. But instead of viewing it as who has killed the most people, view it as what collective lesson are we trying yeah. to learn? Why do, do these atrocities, even now, are they being repeated? In the Again, name of religion. Why are some atrocities being uh, spoken about while others, and she's referring to uh, Afghanistan, hmm. are being ignored? Yeah. Why? Ego ask yourself. Power, I don't know. Ego, power, oppression. Who knows? Ask yeah. yourself, why are these atrocities in the name of God or religion or country or power being perpetuated again and again. I know. Okay, uh, you were known as the mother of Israel. Oh, as a spirit, do you still feel a connection to the nation of Israel and the Jewish people? Most certainly, most certainly. Had you been, she, okay, go ahead. She, um, you know, she is a strong mother, a strong mother. Um, and in her personal life, she felt conflicted as, uh, I mean, with her children, as a, the role she held in her public life versus her personal life, there was often a conflict and difficulty. Yeah. Be because I felt conflicted because I often question whether I was neglecting or uh, ignoring my earthly children in favor of the service work I came to do. Mm. Yeah. I am a, was and am a strong mother who felt that the nature of work had value I ask each of you today to remember your own power and to remember that work, when we come together, has value. To not be afraid of rolling up your sleeves and getting dirty. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Um, have you been in, had, had you been incarnated as a Jewish person before? Your life as, as Golda? Yes. One of the things that she was showing me before um, getting on today was this, it was interesting. She said, um, we're, I think you often ask the question, uh, or people ask the question rather, you know, what is the most important life? Yeah, prior, which, you know? which other life most influenced your one as? Right. In this case, Golda. So she so wanted to she wanted to say, because she said, I could show you my life as a king 
as a dignitary mm -hmm, or as royalty. But I instead would like to show you my life as a slaveholder mm. and talk about the importance of understanding. This is the, the, the theme today, the message or the idea that we all are capable of atrocity yeah. given the circumstance. Yeah. This life, my life as Golda, was in some senses atonement for other lifetimes. I do not wish to speak of my life as a slaveholder to uh, belittle myself or to speak ill of myself as a soul, but rather to give you who listen an expanded perspective, an expanded understanding that you too have been a various aspect of darkness. Yeah. It is and remains a choice within each human to follow the light that they feel as a silent impulse within mm. or to follow the darkness. Each human is given this set of predestined circumstances, mm. but often they, man or woman makes no difference, fail to understand that they too have choice, that they too have power, should they so remember. It is important now as humans, because I say to you with most certainty that you are facing the gravest of challenges, but also in the gravest of challenges, you have the greatest opportunity, far greater than any opportunity you have ever been given on the planet. Will I come back? Yes, I will. Remember simply the choice, the choice point that each of you is given as a silent impulse between light and dark. Remember that you have a choice to light the path forward for those who do not yet have eyes to see what is happening in this world. Show others through your light, not in judgment, standing in judgment of others who falter because you too have faltered. You too have been the oppressor. You too have held slaves in captive. I am not saying this to glorify some of my past actions as a soul, but simply to explain that we are all capable of light and dark. Well, and the atrocities we see before us, she's almost done. The atrocities we see before us are simply a result of human error in thinking yeah well i don't know if i completely agree with you because i think it's very important for us to play the part of dark to teach others what the light looks like i mean we have to come into some incarnations and do horrible things like betray our best friend stab him in the back in order so that, that, that they can learn the, the the one the very important facet of love forgiveness it's like the the Neil Donald Walsh's uh, children's book, The Little Soul in the Sun. I, I think we need to play the part of the dark in order to help the collective. So I, I, yes, I don't think it's yes, sure. I don't think it's an error always in human judgment. Uh, no, you should actually doesn't disagree with you. But one thing she wants to add is that we are at a uh, distinct evolutionary moment. Mm. Okay. 
I, I a, feel it. Yes. Just, you know, because yeah, I feel yeah. it. I feel yeah. it. Yeah. This is a distinct evolutionary moment. And how, how, okay, so I'm just waiting because she's ex, going to give me the right words. Distinct evolutionary moment in which many humans are choosing to uh, integrate past themes. Right? It's like almost like this is the moment in which many humans on the planet are waking or becoming aware of their light. Right. In a distinct manner that is unique to this moment in the evolutionary uh, trajectory of humans. All right, so let's talk about the presidents that you served with, uh, the US presidents. Uh, what did you think about Reagan? And in retrospect, what do you think about Trump and Biden as far as how uh, the relationship with Israel, the, the, you know, the, the Middle East conflict, et cetera. Let's start with President Reagan. Um, she has uh, nothing negative to say about um, any president living or dead. Okay. So Reagan, she felt, um, <laughs> I'm laughing. She, she doesn't have anything negative thing to say, but then she's about to say something negative. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes, uh, and uh, she liked him on a personality level or likes him rather, mm -hmm. um, felt sometimes that he lacked a greater, the understanding of greater conflict or lacked um, mm -hmm. like the uh, lacked understanding of the larger picture. Yeah, that's what okay. she's saying. What that's administration it. did the most to help is, uh, Israeli U US um, relations? in your opinion? Uh, well, this is a, a, a complex topic, yeah. complex and difficult topic yeah. in some ways. She doesn't um, completely agree with uh, some of the policies of either Israel or the US. She just yeah. wants to be clear about that. Sure, of course not. Uh, she doesn't have a strong opinion about who has helped the relations the most. What she will say is that each leader, including myself, has their strengths and their faults. Of for course. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, you saw the Jewish state evolve from just an idea to a reality. What are your thoughts about Israel as, as it exists today? Are you proud of having created this country or are you critical of its missteps? So just- Both. She says both. All right, so- She says, I am certainly proud of the work that I was able to do on the planet. Uh, looks like she influenced and um, a lot of infrastructure is, is what I'm seeing. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so she's proud of that. And that continue, her legacy continues in that respect today. Um, she is not proud or not in agreement rather of uh, some of the policies of Israel in regard to uh, Palestine. Oh, okay. All right. This but she, but she also wants to mention that there are very negative uh, policies uh, that the, the United States actually is involved. Like what? Um, in particular, she has a very big problem with the uh, way that the United States handled uh, Afghanistan. Yeah. Okay. Um, during your lifetime, you were dismissive of the Palestinians, even saying on occasion that you had never heard of them. Do you now have a different attitude toward the Palestinians? Yes. Tell me about that. Um, again, as I have said, all leaders have their strengths and their faults. 
Mm. One of my faults was failing to understand the importance and role of the Palestinian people mm. in my lifetime and their importance to, uh, in the world, right? I regret this misstep and misunderstanding, but as with any leader and with anyone I am mentioning today, I recognize that we all uh, enter the world with human um, of course. misunderstanding. Of course. Well, including, the oh, go ahead. Um, so yeah, she just says that we're all, we all fall short. You know, I'm agreeing with her. I'm like, yeah, I fall. I know, I know my fault. <laughs> I've got lots of them. Yeah. Uh, all right, so, but the Palestinians are saying, wait, you guys took our land. I mean, what, is there any veracity to that? Yes, there is veracity to that. All right, tell me how she what you feels this is that. a error, a error and a misunderstanding on her part. Okay, uh, so and what should be done for the to uh, for the Palestinians? Palestinians, uh, she shows me like a return. So there needs to be like a return of land to the Palestinian people who, who what is rightfully theirs. Oh, wow. Okay. And why she says that this will lot? incite- uh, Why can't this, this one country- she, with It doesn't feel like it will successfully be one country. Um, yeah. She says that this, these sentiments expressed by her will be um, controversial in the comments. Oh, so she's yeah. just- I'm not reading them people, don't even bother. <laughs> she, uh, well, and, and, and she's kind of saying for me, like, don't shoot the messenger. Like I'm just delivering the message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and for I'm any of either of us. Others, but okay. but yeah. she's saying that this uh, is a very heated topic and will be controversial, so. Of course. What is the cause of the endless strife in the Middle East? Are, are Israel and other countries in that area merely pawns in some global game? Hmm. Uh, yes, in a sense, but she doesn't, she says she's not at liberty or an expert to speak on the global game per se. Yeah. She, she can, uh, it's not her expertise, um, but she does from her perspective and vantage point, see that there are people who pull the strings, so to speak. Okay. Now you keep talking about Afghanistan being such a misstep. Can you go further into that? What do you there mean? There is, um, Sorry, she was showing me the image of um, somebody uh, like falling from the airplane. I think we, some people, oh, yeah. we saw that. Yeah, and she was reminding me of that, which I had forgot, not forgotten, but you know, hadn't seen it in a little bit. Yeah. Um, the misunderstanding with Afghanistan, uh, there is an error in thinking and a lack of support in understanding basic human dignity. Um, oh, yeah. She just has a very big problem with it right now. Okay, I agree. Uh, will there ever be lasting peace in the Middle East? And, and also along the same lines, in your opinion, Golda, what is the, uh, the best solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? As to, will there be lasting peace? Okay. I hope to say yes, and will say yes for the purposes of the person or people asking this question. Okay. And yet I do understand the need, hence the purpose of my message today, to remind people of the necessity, the inherent necessity within each human being on the planet today to find peace 
within themselves. Oh, good. Yes. Wow. So maybe that's the, the, the macro is Israeli-Palestinian peace. The micro is peace within each of us. Macro and micro are seen as separate. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you to recall on some uh, cosmic level or through some deeper understanding that macro and micro are in truth not separate, but one and the same. I agree. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu, Bibi, was Israel's longest serving prime minister. Many people have strong feelings about him either way, probably. What do you think of Bibi as a person and as a leader? Um, <laughs> you know, she is, my sense is she's a reticent to criticize leaders. Yeah, yeah. Well, can you tell me just his good points and his bad points? Everybody has them. You can't deny us that. Uh, yeah. Um, she'll start with the, uh, she's saying, because people really had a strong list of her bad points when she's alive and still do to an extent. She's she's with the territory. Territory. Um, so she just wants to mention that. She has her, her column of bad points. Um, uh, he often... He often fails to understand uh, the greater picture of humanity. He is misguided in his attempt to, it's like uh, he wants uh, Israel to remain, or wanted rather, to remain in a certain position of power and this position of power, the United States is, is currently doing this. This position of power uh, is, is of utmost importance. And the way that other people are treated or other countries are treated is often a afterthought. Oh, all right, name so, one good, good point about him. Um, highly intelligent, highly intelligent. Okay. Um, well, did you see the global picture for, of humanity when you were a leader? Uh, n yes and no. I did not fully grasp the enormity of what is at stake as a global, uh, as the global awakening ensues. So she's just, I mean, we view her as as uh, I'm just speaking for a second, we view her as as being alive quite a while ago now. Yeah. But the, from the perspective of spirit, that's just you know really oh, yeah, of course not yeah. very long, right? And so she actually sees it as her, her her life being on the precipice of what we're experiencing now, this global awakening, and how mm -hmm. she kind of like um, was an illuminator during, and she's giving me chills, during this time um, to assist what's what's occurring now. Yeah. Like the, it, she doesn't see it as a long time ago. Um, and so she's, you know, didn't really fully grasp what the enormity of what is happening, but she did feel a, she says, strong call to service. Yeah. A strong call okay. to leadership and a strong call to the understanding that humans in and of themselves are important. Yeah. All right, just real briefly, Obama and Bibi Netanyahu didn't seem to get along very well. Can you tell us about that? Obama's relationship with, with uh, the state of Israel and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu? She does not want to speak on that topic. Okay. You just answered it then. Okay. Um, in your uh, time, Israel was a poor and weak country. Are you surprised that today is considered a rich nation and a world leader in science and technology? I mean, did you imagine that income? I mean, that outcome? 
Yes, she says she was and is able to imagine that outcome. Uh, and that was part of her role to imagine a better outcome. Um, okay. Yeah, she, she could. She really could actually awesome. see this outcome. I didn't know it was weak and poor when she was, uh, you know, prime minister. Israel has always prevented neighboring countries from acquiring nuclear weapons. Should Iran also be stopped from de developing nuclear weapons? Will Iran uh, acquire a nuclear weapon and will it use it? I mean, so basically also, what do you think about the Iran nuclear deal? Um, so she, to answer the, she's because she's saying there's just like a series of questions there, but to answer the first part of the question, yeah, um, no country, she wants to be very clear, no country should be in possession or hold nuclear weapons at this time. Too late. The horse is out of the barn, Golda. She does express some concern over this current situation. Um, that said, uh, she is, yeah, she's just a staunch opponent of all, any and all nations who hold nuclear weapons. Yeah, it's awful. All right, so why is uh, the administration going, uh, uh, trying to make this Iran nuclear deal? Uh, the U.S. administration, why do they want to do that? What's in it for them? Except for the possible destruction of, of Israel. There are uh, other forces at play that she is um, not at liberty to speak about. Okay. Um, she will say that um, in the very near, so this is interesting, in the very near future, Mm -hmm. All um, there will be a an, an agreement within the next ten to fifteen years that all nuclear weapons on the face of the planet will be eradicated. Oh, good. All right. Will the nuclear uh, Iran nuclear deal go through and allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon? Um, possibly yes, but there we are headed as and she's talking about like the larger picture, right? Which she's trying to speak of today. Yeah. Um, as the larger picture is that we are moving, which is, this is good news for, to, for me to hear because I don't like any of this, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but we are moving toward complete eradication of nuclear weapons yeah. on all levels. All right, so good. That's where she sees the trajectory in the future. Good, but going. in the short term, well, yes, she does see it possibly. It, yes. will, will Iran launch a nuclear attack on Israel? I mean, I mean, of course, there's free will. I mean, there's quantum probabilities, but uh, no, no, I don't think so. She doesn't think so. Okay, but it doesn't uh, look. It's it's. She's showing me fire. This is all playing with fire. And the fact that governments are still engaging in this so far very people. base level behavior is a problematic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On the internet, there are so many conspiracy theories involving Israel. Is there truth to any of these or is this just more anti-Semitism? Well, I think we'd have to know the conspiracy systems that the theories are talking about. So, so let's skip that one um israel now gets most of its drinking water from desalination is there a long-term environmental damage from dumping so much salty brine back into the mediterranean sea wow didn't see that question coming hmm. yes there is a negative environmental impact hmm. um she she keeps taking me out to the, the like bigger picture okay the, the bigger picture Mm -hmm. uh, we will have great projects in place in the decade of 2030 to 2040 mm -hmm. to restore the oceans. Oh, nice. All right, Golda, the former head of the Israeli space program publicly said that both Israel and the United States have had contact with a Gal galactic federation of extraterrestrial races. Is this true? And if so, can you tell us more about this? Yes. Uh, 
What she wants to say is that many governments, including the United States and Israel, have had and continue to have contact with galactic races. Mm. This is a, a cat's out of the bag, is what she shows me. The cat's out of the bag. When you were a leader? What? And you knew about this when you were leading? Uh, not consciously, no. Okay, got it. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, no, she didn't. Um, when she was a leader, didn't she shows me it's like she didn't have time to think about all that. No, I bet not. Yeah. She's just busy. Um, no nonsense. <clears throat> and um, but there are there continues to be and uh, contact and it's various nations around the world. It's 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 not just this is the US. Yeah. Yes, it, this is multi uh, spans mul across multi nations. And this information. Yeah. Canada, yes, Canada, yes. This information is beginning to surface in the awareness of many humans, of many humans, and we'll continue. Uh, all right, does Israel have a secret space program? If so, can you tell us about it? Or probably not, since it's a secret, but go ahead. We'll see what we can get out of you. Uh, she just says yes, so does the US. Um, can she tell us about it? not much no she there's not much she it, it's she says she, she likes to speak about and she she can see the broader picture yes but she likes to speak um with uh care and about things she knows about okay okay will israel ever build a canal connecting the red sea to the mediterranean sea not likely from her perspective in this okay. moment. All right, what were some of the challenges you faced being one of the first female elected leaders in the world, especially in a region where women are generally not treated as equal? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, many challenges. She's spoken of one that she'll mention again, but the difficulty in being a mother mm. and being a leader, yeah. There was a often like a guilt she felt or um, like, a, a, you know, I relate to this as I'm saying it, um, but, you know, a feeling that you're failing, like when you're working or you're mothering, you're sort of failing one or the other. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure a lot of moms oh, yeah. relate to that feeling. Um, so she had that, uh, you know, she says, I did not consider myself uh, a pioneer as a woman, it's interesting, hmm. or a feminist, but rather a leader. And one of the things she struggled with is um, being viewed differently, being viewed um, as not as important. But, you know, some of the toughness, because she has a like yeah, a, for I sure. don't know if you if I'm conveying it properly. But yeah, no. There's a there's a there's a toughness to her, you know, and um, and I like it actually. Yeah. But she had to kind of embody that yeah. more strongly in order to succeed in her role. Yeah. Like she had to have a toughness to get the respect from male leaders and most of the world, right? Well, it. She says it's not as much an issue of respect. In some ways she didn't really, um, well, she cared in a sense what people thought of her, but in a, another way she didn't she, that she much. She respect from you. Yeah, but it's more her, in her ability to be effective and right. get oh, yeah. uh, things done. Get the job done. Oh, yes. just like typical woman. Uh, all right, so, um, do you think that you were treated fairly by leaders from the rest of the world, you know, with respect, at least eventually? Um, more or less. Yeah, more or okay. less. Like, uh, yes and no is the answer. All right. Um, Not by all, but by some. By some. Uh, she, she says she earned a place at the table. Yeah, I bet you did. 
All right, what was your spiritual mission in this incarnation? And do you think you fulfilled it? Almost finished. Uh, <laughs> she smiles again and says, more or less, kind of shrugging. Um, my spiritual mission was and continues to be to remind people of their own power and their ability to affect change in the material world. Oh, that's nice. I think you fulfilled it. What do you think? That's she's she's kind of shrugged. She's like a, being a little bit like eh. humble. Yeah. Uh, all right. What was your childhood like? That's not a question on the list, but I kind of always like to know that. Um. Her mother. She's talking about her mother. Uh, she 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 feels that. Her parents are very loving, mm -hmm. but her mother had a, a, a toughness about her, mm -hmm. which she kind of learned from or emulated. Yeah. emulated mm -hmm. Yes. Her mother, um, and she reminds me of, or she's speaking about um, her earliest memories, her very first memories of being persecuted and in um, as a, a Jew mm. and and the difficulty that in this these these memories were central imprints in her life. Okay. They remained the formative experiences mm. from which her leadership um, evolved. So it was very important that she chose to have really difficult early, early childhood experiences in order for her to evolve as a leader. Okay. Like, you know how you were, and she's mentioning this, speaking about how some lives will choose to be the bad guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, it's like she needed this really difficult, challenging experiences a, a leader. to be a leader. And she also needed experiences in her early years of being told she couldn't be oh, something yeah. because she's a woman. So mm -hmm. that she, it's like a firm decision or firm and resolute uh, choice. Okay. Which creates that. Who was your hero? Uh, At least one. Her uh, grandfather. Oh, interesting. What is a little known fact about you that nobody really knows? It can be fun. doesn't have to be serious. And then one more question after that. Uh, that she, so some people, well, because of her tough demeanor um, and the way she um, appeared in the world, people would not understand that she had actually like a very soft and loving side to oh. her. Uh, this was not, she, and purposefully, she did not show this yeah. to the world and did not convey it to the world, but she had this very loving, actually very, I'm hearing the word nurturing aspect to her that felt very motherly. Um, I know she was called the mother, but she was like the tough mother. Yeah. She, but she was also this, has this gentle part of her that's so you cool. know yeah all right so do you have any advice this last question for any for the current israeli or any any world leaders right now um she has two pieces of advice one for world leaders but uh the the most important one she wants to give for people watching the first piece of advice for world leaders is to hmm Follow your instinct when making decisions. Um, she's speaking in particular, and also remember, thank you, she's, she wants me to finish this, to remember that all humans are equally important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's for world leaders. For everyone else want, watching, each and every individual watching this uh, interview today, of which I am most grateful you have watched and listened, 
I want to remind you that you hold the power within to affect change within your lives, within your town, within your community. That's right. I'm so honored to have spoken with you, Prime Minister Golda Meir. Thank you, Eric, for bringing her in and for helping us out with some of those questions. And thank you, Courtney Dillon at CourtneyDillon.com. You guys, please subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell, and share, share, share. I love she you says, all. Oh. Uh, she says thank you, and she's most pleased with this interview today. I thank am you. so honored. Thank you so much. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.